Farrell TV, the voice for humanity. Hi, I am Dustin Pickering, and this is the New York Parrot Literary Corner. We are the voice for humanity. We are seeking creative minds daily, day in, day out for to interview. And today we have Kelly Ann Ellis, who lives, works, and writes in Houston, Texas, where she obtained an MA in English literature from the University of Houston. Co-founder of Hot Poet, she is also a long-term member of Poets in the Loop Critique Group, which is uh, here in Houston. And she has been published in various journals and received awards from the Bay Area Writers League and San Gabriel Writers League. She's also had two winning poems and public poetry's Art Lines Ecrastic Contest. In 2012, her work was showcased in the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Awesome. Two recent publications include a poem and Echoes of the Carliera, a 2018 collection of poems in response to photography, a Senna poem accepted in the Real Poetry Festival in Houston in 2018, and another in 2021. Her work was featured in the Poetry, Music, and Dance production, It's About Love, in the Houston Fringe Festival in 2019. And more recently, her short fiction was performed in the podcast, The Short Story Show, as the second place winner of their 2020 contest. She was nominated in 2020 for a Pushcart Prize, and her poem, Reef, published in Odes and Elegies, Eco Poetry from the Texas Gulf Coast. Kelly travels wherever she can and spends time on the nearby Gulf Coast when she can't, where she enjoys writing fiction an essay, as well as poetry, and where she never fails to find inspiration and the tug of the ocean. Thanks for joining us today. Chloe, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Dustin. So, um, so our, my first question, um, I guess we can start from the bottom up and uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, your education and uh, getting your uh, master's. How, how was that going? And how, how do you think formal education actually um, kind of helped you craft your poetry as it is now? Um, well, when I first came to Houston, I, um, I was young. I had two children already and one um, soon to be on the way. And I, but I still wanted to go to grad school. And at that time, Donald Barthelme had just passed away. Um, but U of H was um, one of the meccas for uh, fiction writing. So I applied to grad school for an MFA in fiction. And the first year I got kind of close. I was in the last, the final cut of 10, but I didn't get in and I sort of defaulted into getting um, a master's in English literature. And um, at that time I started, um, you know, focusing on teaching and um, my family, but eventually I began writing poetry instead of fiction. Instead of fiction. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe having um, a master's in literature helped me to be a little more um, independent because I didn't have the brutal workshopping that happens in MFA programs. Um, I, I was kind of a free agent <laughs> for a while. I had friends that mentored me and helped me and I um, formed, um, poetry groups, critique groups. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I, my style developed more because of my literary influences than because of workshopping. Right. And um, so I, I think that made me a little different. That's interesting. So um, you feel like reading is more influential on you than say, you know, sitting in a group setting and doing a lot of critiquing and workshopping and, and more of a formal setting you rather than than trying to, uh, you know, <laughs> take the uh, sort of um, approach that a lot of people these days, you know, they go into the workshops and they, they do the workshop, the poem to bring the craft out of it. So, so you're saying you, you were more an intuitive reader and you learned the craft getting your master's rather than through that, than those effects. 
Well, I mean, I do workshop. I still take classes and I'm in a critique group, so I'm not discounting workshopping. Right. I'm just saying my early, my early influences had nothing to do with workshop. They had more to do with reading broadly and sort of ass assimilating or integrating things that I read into my own craft. Excellent. Um, so what about, I, I think you have two chat books. I know one is called Marrow. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I can't remember the other title, but do you have, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on how your evolution came from, you know, book one to book two? Well, um, I had a close friend who was also your friend, Glenn Monroe Irby, whose mm -hmm. um, book we just published, um, a collection of his poetry. And he helped me to um, craft my chat books and um, put them together and format them. And I think that I grew from um, doing that because I was able to think in terms of theme and following an arc. And um, mm -hmm. I was able to follow some of my obsessions and um, channel them a little more productively <laughs> than I might have otherwise done. Um, so my first chat book, I don't have a copy of because it was typed up and it's not even on a computer. It's, it's totally hard copy. It was called Reef. Mm -hmm. And my idea was, you know, so much of it is, is submerged. So the metaphor of the reef seemed to work mm -hmm. for that. That's a very um, Gulf Coast thing. Um, yes. And actually, <laughs> the, the poem that just got nominated for, for the push cart was the title poem from mm -hmm. that collection, Reef. Okay. And, um, then I went on to um, uh, do another chat book. I, I mean, I can hold them up. This one was Marrow. Mm -hmm. I remember that And one. that came from um, a, sort of a crisis in my life where I um, lost my job. I got divorced. I moved to um, the countryside and lived on some land east of Dallas. Mm -hmm. And I had this really romanticized version of what that would be like. Um, you know, based on Henry David Thoreau's suck all the marrow out of life, but really um, it was kind of a land of pit bulls and double wives. <laughs> <laughs> so um, most of these poems, and you know, I started thinking that maybe marrow sucking sucked, but most of these poems came from that time period. And again, Glenn helped me with that book. That was the first book he helped me with. And then I, um, I had a a relationship that was pretty tempestuous and this mm. one I dreamed a crooked mile came from that relationship and originally I had patterned my cat is like trying to get attention originally I had <laughs> patterned a lot of um that those poems I had been inspired by the Christina Rossetti poem Goblin Market okay. so I had planned to have a goblin on the cover but every um Every time I looked at art that I would use, it was just too scary. So um, the title poem provided the cover and it's a house that is cracking up. Yeah, it's so pretty good. Really see it and filled so with that's water. That's a dream to Crooked Mile. Um, and then the next one I did was called Some Women Stirred and Shaken. And I don't think you can see that very easily, but it has a martini glass mm -hmm. on the cover and uh, the olives look like a woman. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of a tribute to women friends I've had over the years and their influences on me. Um, and um, so all of these chat books helped me to get, a, to strengthen my voice, to work on my craft, you know, because when you see your work in print, you um, become much more aware of how it comes across and who your audience might be. And I forgot this one. This was the first book that I did with Glenn, but it was the last one I put together. It's oh, nice. called Chain Links. And um, it's um, more about, um, I don't know what I was going through at the time with, with my family, my divorce, my mm -hmm. ongoing um, discontent with life. So I guess it's a little bit all of them are somewhat feminist okay. in their approach to working through issues. And, um, and I have another chat, I have another book, a full length collection that I've been working on called the hungry ghost diner. 
Mm. And it's about that same discontent, that same longing for something that never really fully appears. So um, I'm hoping to find a publisher for that soon. Oh, we'll hope so as well. And speaking of Glenn, we have, uh, I wanted to talk about um, hotpoet.org and the project we, that I, you know, I helped as well as several others. Um, so one of the things I would, I would ask is, okay, what is Hot Poet? And this first uh, project of Hot Poets uh, is uh, the um, Letters Sent Inland, which uh, if you want to, you know, talk a little bit about that and the process behind that. Um, well, okay, Hot Poet um, originated, I guess, about eight years ago. Um, it was um, an idea that I formulated with Tina Cardona and a couple of other poets, and we were sitting at Leon's drinking cocktails, and it was hot, and it was summer, and I said I wanted to do an anthology of poems um, that were sultry and um, maybe a little sexy and call it, Is It Hot Enough For You? And um, Tina said, let's have a party around that theme. So we started throwing solstice parties. And the quickly we realized that not everybody wanted to write sultry po poetry, you know, sexy poetry. So we broadened our concept to include heat in any form, including weather, um, food, um, passion, and politics. So anything that gets you hot was fair game for our party. And we would end up with an instant anthology. We'd ask people to bring 30 copies of a poem that they had never revealed before. And then we'd read each other's poems and try to guess who wrote what um, and put together an instant anthology. And it was a party and we always had fire. We always had fun. Um, Anyway, we had this idea of forming a nonprofit and um, we did do some um, fundraisers for various entities and um, some good works along the way. And we had some venues that were a bit raucous and irreverent. We used to do readings at a bar called Rehab and the series was called Hot Poets in Rehab. Mm. And so, um, but um, last year when, uh, Glenn passed away, um, several of you, several of my friends, including mm -hmm. you, um, approached me and said that they would like to do a book of um, Glenn's poems. And so I thought this is the time to really organize as a nonprofit. And so um, Glenn had left some funding to various poetry organizations and one of those was Hot Poets. So we, um, did all the paperwork and became a, an official nonprofit. And we dedicated some of those funds to, um, to the project. And we call it the Small Press Project, the Wildwood Project. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a little bit of a joke because I think our friend John Milkwright coined that term in one of his hot poet poems. Um, at, Tina lives on Wildwood Way. So the Wildwood Project seemed kind of had a nice sound to it. And it kind of reminded me of that Yates poem um, where he says, I went out to the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head. Mm. So um, anyway, um, you know a lot about what happened. We met weekly. We had several manuscripts that Glenn had put together in PDF form, but we wanted to curate a collection of what we thought was his best work. And um, our concept was uh, for letters sent inland, and I think maybe you came up with the title. I, I don't it was remember Daniel that who, did that. but it was I think a Daniel phrase. came up with the title. Yeah. Okay, it was a phrase from um, from one of the poems, and that made me think that we should start on the coast and work our way inward mm -hmm. to um, other landscapes, and then the most interior landscapes would be, you know, the past, memory, the heart, mm -hmm. the spirit. So we started in that, we went in that direction. So the beginning is mostly coastal poems. The middle is more interior landscapes. The third section is family and memory. And the section that you curated was um, more heart and spirit. And I think it's a beautiful collection. I'm really proud of it. 
I will hold it up because the books just arrived yesterday. Oh, and no. um, it seems appropriate because yesterday was the anniversary of Glenn's death. And also yesterday was Earth Day. Synchronicity. And Glenn loved, loved mm -hmm. all nature and always saw the beautiful in the smallest things. So... I so was glad it came why, why do we, uh, I mean, obviously for us, you know, Glenn was a very important person, but he's also broadly speaking important to the Gulf Coast poetry, all of the poets. I mean, even in Texas, there are a lot of people or he's very, he was very important. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit as a friend of his, why was he important to, to the Gulf Coast region and to poets and, and Texas especially? Um, well, just like Glenn helped me with my books, he helped a lot of poets get published. And um, he, um, he worked tirelessly for poetry. He, you know, uh, did the graphics for um, Austin International Poetry Festival for years and also helped with Houston Poetry Fest. Um, I know at least five people whose books he helped to get published. And um, Glenn actually helped me every year when I was teaching at an early college high school. He helped me put together a chat book of the students' work. Mm -hmm. And um, he never asked for any money or anything from me that it was always, you know, something he did. And so um, I, I feel like we have a debt of gratitude that we owe to Glenn for for promoting poetry and also for being the person that he was. He was someone who listened well, respected everyone, who never found fault as far as I could tell with, with his fellow poets and friends and just was so supportive of everyone's endeavors that I really wanted to do this book as sort of a way to say thank you and you know when you lose someone you always feel like you never thank them enough for the things that they did so um there was that and on top of that glenn was a good poet yes. he um Absolutely. he had a lot of influences from you know uh, dylan thomas and william but william butler yates he was sort of um a very traditional poet but with some quirks of his mm -hmm. own, I think. Yeah, probably. Agree. Absolutely. It, it, I love his poetry. It, and then, like we said, you know, it's very, dimension, very many dimensions to it because we, we've sectioned it off in four sections. So it's it's uh, of different uh, aspects of his work and subject matter and, and approaches. And, I, and that was a lot of, um, it was a lot of work on our part. And I hope people enjoy that. Um, but would you like to read one of your own own poems for us? Um, okay, I will read one. Um, I think I'll read, since we're talking about Glenn, mm -hmm. um, I will read one that I wrote for Glenn um, in the first chat book that he helped me with. And it's called, um, and that's Marrow, and it's called The Wrong Red. And Glenn was, he was a bird, bird watcher. He loved birds. So, um, this I wrote in, when I was living on that land in Kaufman, east of Dallas. The Wrong Red. I called to ask you about the bird, the one I wanted to put in this poem. I was sure it wasn't a cardinal, all prep school sporty bright, for it was red like something smoldering, color of the peaches it hovered amongst, fruit swaying, tenuous, hot, and impatient as East Texas June until overripe they fall. You said it couldn't be a summer tanager, it was the wrong red. Rather, it was likely an orchard oriole. But it was my poem, and I like the sound of tanager better, having heard that word first from you, and willing to forego accuracy for beauty. We argued about this a bit. You were surprised that I would try to write a poem about nature, me ever the confessional poet, confessedly uninformed. You said that bird should have been in Michigan now, and I've never been, but our words that blistering morning blew me there, wafting on that soft gray wind floating in off the great lake, but which one? 
playing with the Pendleton skirts and cloudy dark hair of Ann Arbor sorority girls, the kind I think he once liked. Their clear-skinned Repub clear Republican wearing white linen, ardently reading Kant. But mostly left-wing girls live in Ann Arbor, you told me later. So here it is, my nature poem. They're all about nature anyway. And I am ever that bird of uncertain identity, jaunty, gaudy, hungry, hanging on, waiting for whatever poem or crumb you care to throw me, resting momentarily on my way always somewhere else. So that was one of my early poems that was inspired by Glenn in a conversation we had. That's very, I, I like it. It's, uh, I, and I've read that that poem. I remember that one. For some reason, I especially remember the reading Kant to Republican. <laughs> that was funny. Well, Republican had a little different connotation back then than it does now. Right. But, um, I guess that was an assumption right. on my part. Oh, generalization. You know, it's part of writing is sort of generalizing about your environment a little bit. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's hard to, to be exactly specific on certain things. But uh, what's funny to me about that conversation is that Glenn really wanted me to mm -hmm. say what bird mm -hmm. it actually was, you know? Whereas I was like, I like the sound of tanager, I'm going with that one. And so he was very um, meticulous and quite a perfectionist. And I guess his degree was in the history of science. So there was a side of Glenn that appreciated mm -hmm. you know um knowledge mm -hmm. and so i guess the debate between us formed the basis for that right and it's over it started with this bird and you were arguing or discussing what what is this who is this bird what is this you know what is this uh variety of bird and so it went from that to the you know, random associations that were associate you know that you found in the poem that uh, you know, go further into it, you know, into the poem. That's very interesting. Um, maybe would you like to read another one, another poem? Sure. Um, let me think. What do I want to read? Well, I'll read something from my second book. I dreamed a crooked <laughs> mile, and um, actually, this is. My favorite poem from the book, although it's maybe not my best mm -hmm. poem, but you know, it resonates with what I was feeling at the time. Well, actually I'll read this one. This was the one that won, um, it was a winning poem in the Art right. Lines competition that year. And um, so it's an ekphrastic poem and it was written for a landscape. It was like from the romantic period and it was called The Gust of Wind and um, by um, Gustave Courbet. And you can probably picture those kind of landscapes where there's a storm rolling in mm -hmm. and there's a, a forest. And um, so the voice in here is um, sort of arrogant person who is discounting his students um, attitude about this painting. Um, <clears throat> the realist tutors his eager scholar but you talk like a romantic. It is a gust, not a thrust of wind. There is no intent. Nature is indifferent. Lightning lights on the highest point, the most accessible target in an open field. This verdant green evokes the O of a childish ego, hoodwinked by transcendental hoodoo, unaware that feelings are negligible. Trees don't fight or submit to fate. Skies don't weep, nor do storms ravish innocence. Pods fall, seeds spill against law or will. No need wonder about the drought before or after that shout of thunder, months of whispers insidious, rasping, will it ever rain again? Cruelty is man's domain. It requires effort, forethought, makes us the animal namers, nature rulers. Still you ask, why paint? If I am right, why commemorate something so fleeting, signifying nothing? I don't concede the point. <clears throat> 
Art stokes our illusion of control. That's the truth about beauty. Storms happen sans intention. We claim them for reflection. Such is the nonsense of romance. Forgive or not, my rant. It is an infant sensitivity, my dear, though a must endearing flaw, your headstrong inability to process indifference. So that's a persona poem. Right. And, um, is the, that it reminded me of the person that I was so it's writing from about. So the, the teacher to the student, was, and he's being kind of somewhat condescending, and and you know, but he's he's also being philosophical and saying certain things about life that, you know, I remember the the line, you know, without law or or um, what was it, law or will, you know, nature just happens to have, you know, doesn't have law or will. And then you go into cruelty is uh, is mankind's thing and naming of the animals and you know those those elements. I, I think that was interesting because it's it's a you said as you say it's persona poem, but it also takes on a philosophical dimension and asks questions about why are we like the way we are in terms of cruelty and why uh, why is it our domain? Is the, you know as you kind of ask in that in that poem. So. Well, uh, this is a, kind of an example of what I was saying that I was really influenced by getting an MA in literature mm -hmm. because, you know, when you studied literature, you, literature, you know that the Romantics were very um, into nature and they felt that nature reflected your emotions and that there was a, a, a real tie between your feelings and the outside world. And then after... Um, you know, the Civil War and other things, the realists sort of came on the scene and they said, no, there's, you don't matter. There's no tie between your feelings and nature. And so we had stories like the open boat and just showing that nature is really indifferent to man's feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, and the thing is, this person, the speaker in this poem is indifferent to the feelings of his student right. as well. So thus the last line, your inability to process very arrogant indifference scholar. has to do with their relationship. Right. It's a very as well. arrogant scholar as well as, you know, speaking of art history and you're using that as a vehicle to kind of explore some of the the various movements throughout history of uh, thought and humankind. So we have about uh, 10 minutes left in the program. So uh, one of the things I want to ask you is if you want to plug the uh, upcoming events related to Letters Sent Inland, discuss that a little bit about what the plans are and, and how people can keep in, in up to date with what's, uh, the, what's going on with that. Um, well, um, the book, like I said, it just came in yesterday mm -hmm. and uh, it can be um, ordered from uh, our website, hotpoet.org. And I guess if I weren't so nervous, I'd share that in the chat, but um, mm -hmm. it's easy to access online. Mm -hmm. um, and we are planning a, a virtual event, but I think that is being capped at um, 10 people. So that's basically for people who were involved in the project that are far away and can't attend, plus a couple of other guests that um, Glenn was close to or that would you know, um, want to attend this event. Um, the other event is going to happen at Bohemios um, on Telephone Road in Houston. And that's going to be on um, June 5th. And it's an outdoor venue to accommodate social distancing. They don't, um, they don't have indoor seating there, but it is a covered uh, area. And uh, we're excited because it's our first um, event as an official um, you know, nonprofit. But also it's the first time some of us have been out in over right. a year. <laughs> Um, right. You know, now that people are getting vaccinated and we're, um, you know, sort of opening up a little bit, we thought that we could um, celebrate that by having an in-person event with some protocols in place for social distancing. And uh, we hope to have um, some guest, um, guest speakers. Uh, we want to do um, a slideshow of Glenn's photographs because he was a really good photographer as well. Um, so that'll run in a loop um, on a big screen and we want to have music because I love music. Um, mm -hmm. So we're going in the evening with music. 
And uh, a per the purchase of a book gets you put on our reading list. So we invite you to read uh, a poem of Glenn's and one of your own or two of your own in the spirit of Glenn's poetry and of the occasion. Um, and so we're hoping that we have, you know, people from the community turn out and read. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just excited about um, the the book launch you know i love a party absolutely it's it's always a joy especially with uh a little bit of uh um you know friends and and wine and coffee and whatever else um so my uh you know my, one of my final questions um we have about you know six minutes or so left so i'm wondering where do you see yourself as a creative writer say three to five years from now well, I, um, I did a lot of writing last year and I finished a novella. So I kind of went in the direction of writing some fiction and realized I still love writing fiction. And um, the novella was kind of a Southern Gothic okay. story um, that I'm trying to get published right now. Then I'm working on a collection of um, essays and poems uh, related to growing up in a very restrictive religious environment. And so that's also kind of a hard work. Um, and so I don't see myself only writing as a poet, but I do want to publish my, um, the manuscript I have now and I continue mm -hmm. writing poetry. So I'm, um, you know, I'm always working on my craft and um, finding inspiration from other writers. Um, and also Hot Poet wants to do some things like um, we want to have um, some classes online and in person. Uh, we're, uh, we want to support artists uh, and poets, especially, um, especially people who are experiencing like physical or emotional pain and are not able to get out as much or to interact as much as they would like to. We want to have sort of a support group for uh, for their writing, uh, whether they're older poets or people with, um, you know, health issues. Uh, we wanna build community and be there for them. Um, also, um, we're just going to move when the spirit says mm -hmm. move. You know, we, we um, try to see what good we can do in the world. And, pursue that. So our retreat this summer will be themed around uh, bringing awareness to climate change and we'll end up somewhere on the Gulf Coast. Excellent. With that agenda. Excellent. There's a little bit of an activism going on as well as, as literature and, and you're broadening out and back into uh, prose writing as well. That's great. I look forward to that. Um, so my, you know, what, what else do you do as far as like, I mean, what are you doing uh, outside of, of uh, writing and, and what are your goals for yourself? Um, well, I mean, a lot of my time has been, been taken with um, starting the nonprofit and getting the website going. And, um, but I, as you mentioned in my bio, I do love to travel mm -hmm. and I'm uh, before the pandemic, I made several trip, several trips to Mexico and um, specifically San Miguel and Tulum and then some to the Northeast. So I would like to plan a retreat for fellow writers and um, I, I do want to travel on my own in the near future as, as things start to open up again. Um, and I have a family four daughters that I love dearly, mm -hmm. three cats, a boyfriend. So, I mean, Excellent. I stay busy. That's a lot of stuff to juggle at once as well as writing. So how do you, do you find, you've, you've kind of stated, you know, you, you feel art is therapeutic and, and uh, how do you see it as therapeutic? Well, I think that we, um, I used to explain to my students that, you know, the, our thoughts and our feelings, they're really just chemicals in our brain. They're really, they're intangible. So we have several tools for expressing those things. We have dance, we have art, and we have the written and spoken word. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think that it's important for everyone to have a creative outlet so they can express the things that are inside them because 
Otherwise they just are um, kind of simmering in their own juices. And um, it, it brings us together. It makes us um, aware of each other. And it's a gift that we give to each other and to the world when we write. So I, um, I agree. I guess I'm waxing philosophical, but um, mm -hmm. That's fine. deep down, I think that we have gifts and we give gifts. I think so too. So for those out there who are, um, you know, listening in and our viewers, uh, what is your final message for artists and globally as well as, you know, locally, uh, since we're talking about Houston as well? Well, um, our, our mission statement for Hot Poet was to um, put the passion in poetry, to uh, write passionately about things we are passionate about and inspire passion in others. So um, I, I think that um, we should be driven by um, the things that we're passionate about and that those are the things that will land well and help other people as well to find what they what they love and to do that as well excellent does that make uh, sense i said yes, passionate it, a yes, lot but. yes just be passionate and draw your energies towards you and uh, that's our final message with kellyanne ellis here is uh, at the new york parrot literary corner and it's been a great talking with you thank you very much for joining us and i am dustin pickering and we're doing the 1 million subscriber challenge. So all people viewing this, please subscribe, like our videos, tell others about us. We're also collecting donations at paypal.me slash nyparrot. So please uh, just feel free to donate. That'll help us out quite a bit with gathering some uh, goods for our, to improve our programming and our presentation. And thank you again for viewing. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening out there. And thank you again, Kelly, for joining us. Thank you for having me, Dustin.